Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to be telling you about um, some undergraduate research I've done with folks uh, in the area of tropical geometry. Uh, the big thing I will be telling you about today is what the heck is tropical geometry? It's even among mathematicians, not exactly a household word. Um, so I'll spend some time telling you what that is, why people might care about it, why the heck it's called tropical. Uh, and then towards the end, I'll tell you about how I've um, used research in this topic as a mentorship opportunity for undergraduates who are interested in math research, why I think it's a nice setting for that. Um, I will go ahead and just mention, I will have to duck out at 12.59 because I have a meeting at one. Um, I'll try to cut myself off well before that so we can ask lots of questions. But if I vanish before you can ask me the question you want, feel free to email me. Um, so to motivate tropical geometry, uh, I'm first going to like go to some very basic stuff in mathematics, namely arithmetic. So some of the first arithmetic we ever learn is that we can add and multiply numbers. So for example, 2 plus 3 is 5, 2 times 3 is 6, you know, we fill out all these fun times tables and things like this. Uh, we're very used to that kind of thing. Um, uh, it has a lot of nice structure that, you know, we maybe take for granted some of the time. Uh, so let me give you a couple of, of examples of structure I really like about addition and multiplication. Uh, there's something called a zero element, namely zero. And what this means is that you can take zero, add it to whatever, and you get out the same whatever. So it's an element that when you add it to stuff, everything's unchanged. Um, and that's, it turns out, a nice thing to have. Uh, we also have something called a unity element, uh, or in this case, just the number one, uh, where if you multiply one by whatever, you get the same whatever amount. Uh, sometimes people call this added well, identity. Yeah. You're, watch, you're, I, I don't know if your mic is getting hit or something. Just watch out for the, your microphone itself, because I don't want to uh, sacrifice yeah, we'll the audio we'll, quality just for recording purposes. Sure thing. Uh, my one thought is maybe my headphones are messing that up, so maybe I'll actually unplug those. They might have a mic in them. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Hopefully, hopefully it'll sound better. Yeah, no, this is perfect. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so and sometimes we call those an additive identity and a multiplicative identity. They're things that leave everything unchanged uh, when you perform those operations with them, which it turns out is a pretty nice thing to have. Um, also, these operations play nicely with each other. Uh, so some people may remember the distributive property. So if I look at a times b plus c, that's the same thing as doing a times b and a times c separately and then adding those together. So there's some natural interaction between these two operations. Uh, another nice thing is that we can cancel things out. Uh, so we can subtract, uh, that is we can undo addition. We can also divide as long as we're careful not to divide by zero. Uh, and so I really am kind of thinking of subtraction as like undoing addition. So you know, two plus three is equal to five, like I've got on this equation here. Uh, if I want to get back to three, I can do that. Uh, in particular, I just add negative two, which is really the same as subtracting two. So um, some people will call that an additive inverse, something that undoes an addition. Um, and similar with multiplication, you can divide by things as long as they're not zero. Uh, so these are all nice properties. Uh, there's other nice ones. For instance, it doesn't matter what order you add or multiply things in, two plus three, three plus two, same thing. Um, but there's all these nice properties usual arithmetic has. And we're going to want to be thinking about these properties when I change our rules of arithmetic up on you to something I'm going to call tropical arithmetic. And we're still going to be adding and multiplying numbers, but I'm going to change what it means to add and what it means to multiply. So what it means to add two numbers tropically, which I'm going to represent with this funny little circular uh, plus symbol, uh, is I'm going to take the minimum of those two numbers. So I'll say plus, but really it's just picking which one of those is the smaller one. And then when I do tropical times, which is this funny little uh, circled time sign, uh, I'm just going to do good old fashioned addition. So for example, two plus three in this tropical world is two, because I'm just going to look at those two numbers, A and B, and pick the one that's smaller. Similarly, if I look in the tropical world at two times three, well, that's good old fashioned two plus three. So that's going to be equal to five. So these are just new and different rules of arithmetic. Uh, for how I add and multiply numbers. Now, of course, I can do more complicated sequences of operations. For example, I could do two plus three times seven. Well, okay, two plus three, that's gonna be two. Times seven is secretly plus seven, so two times seven is then nine. Um, 
I might try to do that in another way. Maybe I'm bold and think I can distribute things out. So maybe I do two times seven and three times seven and then add those tropically. Uh, you can check that that would actually still give you nine. Uh, now, for the most part, we're just dealing with usual numbers. Um, in this case, I'm just looking at whole numbers. Uh, there's one extra number I want to throw in, and I'm going to call that number infinity. Uh, and all you need to know about infinity is that it's bigger than every real number. Uh, that's all I need to know about it. So maybe I have an equation and infinity shows up in it. So I'm looking at infinity plus minus one plus one. Well, minus one plus one, that's just minus one, because remember, I'm taking the minimum. And the really important thing to know about infinity is if I add it to something, well, I'm taking the minimum of infinity and that other thing. Well, I just said infinity is bigger than everything. So the minimum is always going to be the other thing. So infinity plus minus one is just minus one. And it doesn't matter that that's a negative one. It could be any other number. Um, so this might seem like a weird way to do arithmetic, but it turns out we still have lots of, but not quite as much nice structure as we're used to in our uh, world of um, classical arithmetic. Uh, so, for example, uh, there is uh, a zero element. I'm going to put quotes around zero because it's not actually zero anymore. Uh, in particular, uh, infinity is going to behave like zero because if I do infinity plus whatever, I get out the same whatever, as we sort of already said with that minus one. Uh, similarly, if um, uh, we want to think about a multiplicative identity, that is something that multiplies and doesn't change stuff, uh, well, zero actually plays the role of that, because zero times something is secretly just zero plus something in the good old-fashioned meaning of the word plus. Uh, and so um, zero is now our multiplicative identity, which is kind of a weird thing. Uh, similarly, it turns out things do distribute nicely. See if you can convince yourself that multiplication and addition play together in the same way. Um, there is one big thing that we lose, though, and that's that we can't subtract anymore. So we already saw that 2 plus 3 is equal to 2. Now, if we could subtract, that means I should be able to add something to the right-hand side to cancel out and get back to 3. But if I do 2 plus something, that's the minimum of 2 and something, there's no way that's ever going to be 3. Maybe it's going to be 2, maybe it'll be something smaller, but it's never going to actually be equal to 3. Um, and so that's the one big thing we lose by redefining arithmetic this way. Subtraction isn't possible. Uh, it is actually possible to divide things as long as we're not trying to divide by infinity because multiplication in this tropical world is addition and we can undo that with good old-fashioned subtraction. So you can divide tropically, you just can't subtract tropically. Um, so this is a very funny and weird way to do arithmetic. Uh, so the next two things I'm going to tell you are answers to some why questions you might have. One of those is why the heck is this, am I calling this tropical? Uh, the other why is why on earth would we ever do something like this? Why would we replace addition and multiplication with min and plus? So why it's called tropical uh, comes back to um, this uh, mathematician and computer scientist named Imre Shimon. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He's from Hungary originally. I think that's how you say um, uh, Simon in Hungarian. Uh, so although he was born in Hungary, he actually lived most of his life uh, in Brazil. He was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, and he did a lot of the initial work in this min plus sort of setting, especially as it pertains to geometry, which we're going to talk about a little later. Uh, and so in the early 1990s, a few French mathematicians were sort of basing some foundational work on things he had done, and they wanted to name this in honor of him somehow. And I guess Shimonian geometry didn't have a good ring to it. So they thought to themselves, well, let's see. Uh, he teaches in Brazil. Brazil is in the tropics, that is between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So we'll just call it tropical geometry, which is a pretty silly reason to name it that. Uh, for one thing, there's about 40% of the world's population living between those two lines, and a lot of them are mathematicians who have done lots of cool things that have nothing to do with this. So it's a little unreasonable to single this out as being the tropical mathematics. Uh, the other reason it's a little silly is if you look very closely at a map of Brazil, you'll notice that Sao Paulo, where uh, Professor Shimon was, is actually a little bit south of the Tropic of um, Capricorn meaning that he wasn't actually in the tropics when he was doing all of this work. Uh, the most charitable interpretation I've seen is, well, maybe he was, you know, commuting across the tropics or something like that. But anyway, that's, that's where the name tropical comes from. It's sort of stuck. Uh, and, so, and so we apply the adjective tropical to all these, all these things. Uh, so 
in terms of why people would do this, why on earth we would look at min and plus, uh, I'm going to give you the first historical answer, which actually predates the work that Professor Shimon did. Uh, I'm going to call it tropical linear algebra. I think people then would have just called it min plus uh, algebra. And this dates back to the 1960s. So one of the core uh, areas in mathematics is something called linear algebra. And if you haven't seen much of it before, don't worry. It studies fairly simple sets of equations, uh, in particular linear sets of equations. So here, for instance, we've got two equations and two unknowns, uh, x1 plus x2 equals 8, 2x1 minus 3x2 equals 2. Uh, it's linear because we don't have any of the variables multiplied by each other. There's an x1, there's an x2, maybe they've got some coefficients out front, uh, and then you want to solve um, that system of equations here. Uh, sometimes people like to write this in a matrix notation. So you get a little two by two matrix that encodes the coefficients. So there's a coefficient of one here, one here, two here, and minus three here. And then you multiply that matrix by some fun matrix multiplication rules with your unknowns and you get out some solution. So really those are just two ways of encoding the same set of things. And, um, you know, even if you haven't taken a linear algebra course, maybe you've had to solve problems like this before. Maybe you solve for one variable and then plug in to solve for the other. Maybe you multiply one equation by something and subtract it by another to simplify down. There's all sorts of things you can do to try to solve these. So tropical linear algebra is gonna study the same sorts of um, linear equations. So you know, you're gonna have some variables, they're multiplied by some coefficients, you're adding them all up. They're equal to something, but all the operations are now these tropical ones. Um, and so there's essentially the same set of equations that we had before, but now it's all tropical. If we wanted to, we could still write that as a matrix multiplication. Maybe I'll put a little tropical times there to remind myself it's tropical. Um, so secretly, uh, if we unpack what these things mean, that tropical linear uh, equation, one times x1 plus one times x2, that's the minimum of one plus x1 and one plus x2, and that's supposed to be equal to eight. And then similarly, there's an interpretation of the second equation. Um, so we're looking at these tropical linear equations, which are actually about minimums of uh, different, um, uh, you know, constant plus one of our variables. Uh, and if we're trying to solve these sorts of equations, even though they look similar, it turns out we lose most of our tools from linear algebra. Uh, so one of the big tools in linear algebra is something called Gaussian elimination. That's where you take one equation, try to subtract it from another one to simplify things down. We can't do that anymore because we can't subtract things tropically. So there's no more Gaussian elimination. If you're familiar with linear algebra, you may, may remember there's something called uh, matrix inverses. So if you're lucky, you may be able to take your matrix and find another matrix that basically cancels it out, almost like you're dividing by that matrix. It turns out you don't have those so much in the tropical world. So a lot of our tools sadly go away. Um, another important thing that comes up in linear algebra is determinants, which are a number that you associate to your matrix. Uh, so for example, in this two by two case, if you look at the determinant of A, B, C, D, it's A times D minus B times C. So it's a number that you associate to that matrix. So for example, that matrix up there has one times minus three, which is minus three, minus two times one. So this has determinant minus five. Uh, and somehow that number has something to do with your matrix, you can kind of define a tropical determinant. Again, you just multiply some stuff. You can't subtract things anymore, but addition is kind of like subtraction. So you just put a plus sign in there instead of a minus. Um, so we lose a lot of things. We can kind of have some of the similar sorts of things. But the reason that we would think about these sorts of problems is they actually have tons and tons of applications. Uh, so I think some of the examples people point to a lot are scheduling problems. Uh, and it turns out that if you have a scheduling problem, maybe a bunch of airplanes flying into an airport and then of course flying out, you've got a bunch of folks who have to change their gates and there's some amount of time it takes you to get from one gate to another and you want to know, hey, is everyone going to make their uh, flights on time? And there's a zillion other scheduling problems that can be phrased like that. They actually boil down to solving one of these equations where you've got a matrix times a vector equal to some other vector. And that's exactly the sort of thing we have right here. And so if you want to solve scheduling problems, knowing how to solve tropical linear algebra ends up being super useful. I also really like uh, this one problem called the job assignment problem. I'm going to phrase it kind of generally, but then I'll say what it is in sort of a very specific case. Let's say you've got a group of people, N of them. I don't know, maybe we've got 100 people. You've also got 100 jobs. Uh, and you need to assign each person a different job. So sort of everyone's going to take on some task, uh, and that'll, you know, help us accomplish some big thing altogether. 
And of course, some people are better at certain tasks than other tasks. So let's say there's some cost, maybe it's a time cost or a money cost for person I doing job J. So there's 100 times 100 equals 10,000 different costs. And what we might wanna do is figure out what's the minimum total possible cost. How should we assign jobs so everything's the most efficient? And it turns out remarkably that the minimum possible total cost is actually the tropical determinant of this big, for our case, 100 by 100 matrix. That's just all these um, different uh, job uh, costs. So to be super concrete, let's say we had two people in two jobs. So maybe we've got me and we've got Adam. Uh, and uh, each of us has to do one job, job one or job two. Maybe my costs for job one is A, and my cost for job two is B, and Adam's cost for job one is C, and Adam's cost for job two is D. Well, either I get job one and Adam gets job two, or vice versa. Uh, so if I get job one and Adam gets job two, then the total cost is A plus D, whereas if we swap our jobs, then maybe the total cost is B plus C. And so what's the minimum total cost? Just the minimum of those two things. That's actually exactly this tropical determinant here. So it turns out that all of these topics from linear algebra that have natural you know, analogs in this tropical world uh, are actually really useful to solve. You're solving optimization problems, sort of slightly more discrete kinds of things compared to classical linear algebra. But this was originally why people sat down and said, hey, we should think about this min plus stuff and figure out how to solve things. Um, now, this isn't quite what I would call tropical geometry. Um, geometry should have some geometric things going on in it. So I'm going to change gears a little bit now and tell you about an area that tropical geometry is sort of inspired by. Uh, and that area is called algebraic geometry. So over the next three slides or so, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what algebraic geometry looks like uh, and where a lot of our motivation for tropical geometry is going to come from. Uh, so algebraic geometry at its core is the study of sets defined by polynomial equations. Uh, and so let me give you a quick example of a polynomial equation, x squared plus y squared equals one. So these are kind of like our linear equations before, except we're allowed to multiply variables. So I could have an x squared or an x cubed. I could have an x times y. I'm allowed to multiply those together. I can't do anything too crazy. I, I can't have like a two to the x. So it just looks like variables multiplied by each other, maybe with some coefficients. And maybe I've got some equation on one side, some equation on the other side, and I'm setting them equal. Now, if you, you may recognize this equation, it turns out that this equation defines a shape, namely a circle. Uh, in particular, a circle that has radius one uh, centered at the origin. So I didn't mark the origin, but maybe zero comma zero is right here. And so what do I mean by when I say that that equation defines that shape? Uh, I mean that if you look at some point in the two-dimensional plane, uh, maybe that point is a comma b, and I plug a in for x and b in for y, I want to know whether or not this equation is satisfied. So it's not quite satisfied, for instance, if I plug in 0, 0. It is satisfied if I plug in, say, the point 1 comma 0. Uh, that does satisfy that. In fact, uh, it's satisfied exactly when I'm on this sort of um, circular shell that I've got going around here. Uh, and so that equation defines a circle. Uh, now, um, algebraic geometry is sort of about the interplay between these two perspectives. On the one hand, you've got an algebraic equation. On the other hand, you've got a geometric shape. Um, now, there's some immediate stuff you can read off in terms of the geometry just based on the equation. There were two variables in this equation, x and y. That meant this shape was going to live in a two-dimensional space because I'm plugging in some coordinate for x and some coordinate for y. So it should be some subset of a two-dimensional space. So if instead I had a polynomial equation in three variables, x, y, and z, then my um, uh, set defined by that, the set of all points satisfying that equation, that's going to live in a three-dimensional space with an x, y, and z coordinate. Turns out that the set of points defined by that equation is this pretty red surface right here. It actually stretches on infinitely far, so I had to cut it off. Um, but these are the sorts of shapes algebraic geometers define, uh, uh, study. They're shapes that are defined by these polynomial equations. And one thing I should mention that algebraic geometers like to do is rather than thinking of it as polynomial equals polynomial, they actually move all the stuff from the right-hand side over to the left-hand side by subtraction, like so. And so it just looks like a single polynomial equaling zero, or in this case, a single even bigger polynomial equaling zero. Uh, and you'll notice that's really the same thing. I mean, you know, uh, point's going to satisfy one version if and only if it satisfies the other. 
Um, and uh, so what algebraic geometers will sometimes say is you're looking at the set of points that makes the polynomial vanish. Uh, and by vanish, they mean be equal to zero. So these are the objects studied by algebraic geometers. Uh, I want to tell you about sort of the two simplest cases of algebraic geometry. Um, one is so simple that the geometric shapes are actually very boring. Uh, so this is algebraic geometry when we only have one variable. So uh, we have to have some polynomial in one variable. Maybe that variable is x. So for example, we have maybe x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c, uh, where a, b, and c are some coefficients. And an algebraic geometer wants to know where does that polynomial vanish? That is, <clears throat> where is that polynomial equal to zero? Uh, well, the usual trick that we know from maybe middle school is that if we want to know where something vanishes, it's nice to draw a graph of it. Uh, and so we plot out x versus f of x, and we get this sort of sinusoidal shape. And the points we're interested in are where it crosses that x-axis, because that's where f of x is equal to zero. So it turns out, at least in this picture, there are three values of x, alpha, beta, and gamma, that make that polynomial f equal to zero. So if an algebraic geometer looked at that polynomial, they would say, ah, that will define a set consisting of just three points, uh, namely alpha and beta and gamma. So in some sense, algebraic geometry in one variable is not very interesting because the geometric shapes are just finite collections of points. There's not very much interesting geometry going on. Um, but there's still a nice interplay behind, you know, these three solutions to our equation and the equation itself. In particular, there's a fun theorem called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra that tells us that those alpha and beta and gamma actually give me information about that polynomial f. In particular, we can actually factor f as the product of three simpler polynomials, x minus alpha, x minus beta, and x minus gamma. Now, there is some fine print here because there's always the chance that our polynomial actually didn't have any solutions over the real numbers. What if my polynomial had been x squared plus one and I was setting that equal to zero? Well, I can't have x squared equals minus one over the reals because nothing squares to a negative number if you're a real number. Um, and so then this wouldn't quite be true. So we actually have to let alpha and beta and gamma all live in the complex numbers, which is a generalization of the real numbers where you're allowed to do things like take square roots of negative numbers. So uh, this picture is sort of the right thing to be keeping in mind, Sometimes we do need fine print to make sure these things are true. Um, so that's algebraic geometry in one variable. In two variables, things are a little more interesting. So this is kind of like where we had our circle, our x squared plus y squared equals one. And in general, a polynomial in two variables is gonna describe what we would call a plane curve. So a curve that sits in our plane. So the circle is an example of that. Um, here's a bigger polynomial, higher uh, degree. We've got like an x to the fourth and an x squared times y squared term. Uh, and if you look at the set of points satisfying this equation, you get this fun little uh, quadrio, uh, I don't think it's called a quadrio, quartet, I guess, of either lima beans or boomerangs, depending on your opinion, sitting in uh, R2. Again, there are times when we'd rather work over the complex numbers, just because theory is nice over the complex numbers. Um, I won't go into too much details. You can try to draw pictures of things over the complex numbers, and it turns out that your one-dimensional curve kind of looks two-dimensional because complex numbers are two-dimensional over the reals. And somehow this curve can be thought of as a surface of a donut that has three holes in it. And there's a huge rich story in, by what I mean by all that. Um, but it turns out that there is this picture we can associate to this equation. Uh, and as mathematicians love to do, we love to use numbers to describe things. So I'd say that this curve has degree four that's just looking at its equation. You've got x to the fourth, you've got x squared, y squared, the sort of biggest total number of variables in any term is four. So that's degree four. Circle on the other hand was degree two. Uh, and then I would say it has genus three. And that's something you can read off from this weird picture. Genus is the number of holes in this. And you don't have to really know what that means. Just know that it's an important number we can associate to a curve. Now, uh, I guess I do have one last slide on the geometry of plane curves. There's lots of beautiful classical results about them. Uh, one very old one, Bayes' theorem, I guess it's three years younger than America, uh, proved back in 1779. Uh, two smooth plane curves of degree D and E intersect in D times E points. And there's gonna be some fine print, which I won't go into, but let's look at what that means in this example. We've got our circle, remember that's degree two, that was that x squared plus y squared sort of equation. Uh, this uh, red curve I've drawn is a cubic equation, 
Uh, so we've got a degree two equation and a degree three equation, and they're intersecting in one, two, three, four, five, six points. And that is indeed two times three. And Bayes' theorem says this always happens. We have to be careful again. We might have to work over the complex numbers. We might worry if uh, maybe one of them's tangent to another one. Uh, maybe they have to be counted with some multiplicity. But these are the sorts of items that uh, algebraic geometers think about, these geometric shapes defined by these polynomial equations and the interplay between those two worlds. So now I'm ready to tell you what tropical geometry is. And basically tropical geometry is gonna be studying shapes defined by polynomials, except we're gonna think of everything tropically. Uh, and this is more recent, this is more what uh, Professor Shimon was doing, it really got started in the 1980s. Uh, and early 90s. So here's an example of a tropical polynomial in one variable. It looks just like a usual polynomial in one variable, x cubed plus ax squared and so on, except every operation is tropical. So secretly, this x cubed, that's x times itself three times tropically, that's actually x plus x plus x, because tropical multiplication is good old fashioned addition. And so really that x cubed should be thought of as three x. Similarly, we've got a times x squared, or a times x times x. That's secretly a plus x plus x, so that's a plus 2x. Similarly, for this being b plus x, and then c is just c, and we're adding all those together. So it's the minimum of those four terms right there. So if we think of f of x as a function, maybe from the real numbers to the real numbers, it's the minimum of these four linear equations. And if you try to graph that out, you're not going to get a smooth curve anymore, but you will get something that's piecewise linear. It sort of has a region that has slope 3. That's when 3x is the minimum. At some point, let's call that point alpha, it might switch to having a plus 2x as the minimum. Then it switches to having b plus x as the minimum. And then it switches to having c at the minimum. So that's what the graph of this function would look like. Now, in algebraic geometry world, what we did is we looked for where this graph crossed the x-axis, and that was sort of important. Well, this graph does cross the x-axis right there, but it's not an especially interesting point, uh, and it only happens one time. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't be looking for where this crosses the x-axis. I would say the most interesting points in this graph are actually this alpha, this beta, and this gamma. And that's where these little folds occur, where you sort of have a crease uh, going from one piece to another piece. Uh, another way to look at that is at that point, we actually have a tie between that 3x term and that a plus 2x term. Similarly, there's a tie going on at beta and there's a tie going on at gamma. So these are the points where that minimum isn't unique. The minimum is being achieved by at least two of those terms. So that seems to be more interesting. And remarkably, it turns out that um, a similar theorem holds if we just, uh, to the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra, if we just declare those to be the roots of our polynomial or the points where our polynomial vanishes. In particular, we can actually factor f of x as, well, not quite x minus alpha, remember there's no minuses, but instead x plus alpha times x plus beta times x plus gamma. So somehow this alpha, this beta, and this gamma are behaving like the points that made our polynomial equal to zero. And that's gonna motivate this definition we're gonna say that one of these tropical polynomials vanishes tropically if a point, uh, if at some point, uh, that minimum is achieved at least twice. So for example, this polynomial vanishes at alpha because 3x is achieving the minimum there, but so is a plus 2x. So rather than vanishing meaning equals zero, vanishing now means minimum is achieved at least twice. Now geometrically, in one variable, we're still just getting finite collections of points. Things aren't so interesting. So let's bump it up to two variables and see what sorts of geometric objects we're going to get out. Uh, and so we're going to call the objects we get out tropical plane curves. So a tropical plane curve, again, this is just going to be living in our two-dimensional space, R2, the two-dimensional plane. Uh, and it's going to be defined by a tropical polynomial P of x, y. And again, remember, what do I mean by defined by? Rather than letting that polynomial equal zero, we're looking for the points where the minimum is achieved at least twice. So just as an example, let's say we had p of x, y equals x plus y plus zero. Uh, secretly, that's the minimum of x, y, and zero. Uh, so if I plug in, say, two comma three, it looks at two, three, and zero and spits out zero, because that's the minimum. Uh, so what's the set of points where that minimum is achieved at least twice? 
it turns out it looks a little bit like this, where I've got a point at the origin right here, and then I've got three rays emanating out from it. Sorry, I left off the arrows to leave a little bit of a cleaner picture. So why is this a set of points where the minimum is achieved at least twice? Well, I've got three terms. To have the minimum achieved twice, I need two of them equal to each other, and then they can't be any bigger than the third one. So for example, maybe I had zero equals y, but then x has to be at least as big as those. And that's exactly this ray. That's the ray where zero equals y, and x is at least as big as both of them. Similarly, if x equals y, and, that's, uh, and zero is at least as big as those, we get this ray going down like so. So this sort of splits the plane up into three regions. Up here, that's where zero would win for the minimum. Down here, that's where y would win for the minimum. And over here, that's where x would win for the minimum. And so this tropical plane curve is the set of point where, points where ties are occurring, where that minimum is being achieved at least twice. Now, this is a pretty simple looking polynomial. It's linear. There's no powers of anything, no x's times y's or anything like that. So I'm actually gonna call this shape a tropical line because it's defined by a linear equation and shapes defined by linear equations. We often call those lines if we're living in two dimensions. Um, in fact, you could look at more general equations. You could do a times x plus b times y plus c, where a, b, and c are some real numbers. And it turns out you'd actually get the exact same sort of shape out. You might slide around where it sits. You might have a different point uh, where the three-way tie is going on. But basically, any shape that looks like that, up to sliding it around, is a tropical line. And just to convince ourselves that this is somehow a reasonable version of geometry, it turns out that tropical lines behave what we might call normally. Uh, so in the classical world, if I pick two lines in the plane at random, they're probably going to intersect in a unique point. So for example, this red line and this blue line intersect in this purple point. I have to say random because I might get really unlucky and have two parallel lines and then those don't intersect at all. Or we might get unlucky and pick the same line twice, in which case, you know, then they would um, uh, have infinitely many points in common. Uh, so random there's doing a little bit of heavy lifting. But it turns out the same is true tropically. If I pick two tropical lines totally at random, like this blue tropical line and this red tropical line, it turns out they intersect in a unique point. Now, again, that random's a little important. You could imagine sliding this uh, blue line down till their rays overlapped, and then you would have some infinite number of intersection points, but that sort of would be a weird edge case. Um, and so for random tropical lines, they behave like normal lines. So this should convince us that this version of geometry is somehow a reasonable thing. Uh, now, of course, I might have a higher degree polynomial. Maybe I've got this quadratic equation, so x squared and x times y and y squared and some lower order terms, maybe multiplied by some uh, um, coefficients, a through f. If I thought of that as a function from r2 into r, uh, I would get this graph uh, that looks like this piecewise linear thing. This is kind of like that cubic graph I had, except a two-dimensional version of it. And of course, there's different things that are achieving the minimum, depending on what I'm plugging in. So I get these different pieces sitting in three dimensions fitting together. Then the tropical curve that's getting defined here, uh, that is going to be um, uh, essentially the shadow of all these creases, the places where ties are occurring with each other. So there's the tropical curve that we would get out of that. Now, personally, it would be very hard, I think, to just picture what that uh, graph is going to look like in three dimensions and then project that down. That seems very tricky to me. Um, so I'm going to instead tell you a nicer recipe uh, for how to draw a tropical plane curve. Uh, and we'll sort of use this, uh, this one as an example, where it's degree two. Uh, and it turns out that there's a nice relationship between these tropical polynomials and polygons. So I'm going to build a polygon, namely this triangle down here, based on my polynomial. And how I built it was, well, I looked at what kind of terms I had. I had an x squared term, which is sort of x raised to the 2. There's no y's, so it's like y raised to the 0. And so I'm going to associate to that term the point 2 comma 0. So this is the point 2 comma 0 in the plane. And then I've got an x, y term, that's x to the 1, y to the 1. I'll associate that to the point 1, comma 1 in the plane, and so on. And then each of those terms gets a point associated to it. And I get this nice little triangle that has a vertex at 0, 0, one up uh, at height 2, and one over at x coordinate 2. Uh, and so just looking at the sorts of terms showing up, I can build this polygon associated to my polynomial. Uh, 
Now I'm gonna do a very fancy thing. I'm gonna think of this polygon as living flat in the plane, like so, and I'm gonna plot some points above it. Uh, namely, I'm gonna plot a point at some height above every one of those little um, uh, integer coordinate points. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick those heights based on the coefficients of these terms. So for example, I had an x squared term that corresponded to this point here. It had uh, this coefficient a, so this thing is gonna be up at height a. Similarly, all of these other points are gonna be at heights given by the coefficients of those polynomials. Now, I'm gonna do a fancy thing called taking the lower convex hull of these points. And basically, this means I'm gonna take a big giant rubber sheet, stretch it below all of them, and then yank it upwards off to infinity and see where it catches. And in this case, it's gonna catch maybe on these three points first, forming a little triangular shape. Uh, but then it's going to keep stretching up until it catches on those ones as well. So you get some little three-legged starfish sort of doing crunches or something like that, floating around in 3D. Then we're going to project the creases of that little starfish down onto the polygon. So I have this little crease here, this crease here, and this crease here. That projects down and splits up my triangle into smaller triangles. And so any fans of The Legend of Zelda will uh, appreciate that triangulation, I imagine. Uh, and the great thing is, this little triangulation, this way of splitting my polygon up, actually tells me what my tropical curve looks like. So I have to turn it upside down, but then the tropical curve is dual to this subdivision or this triangulation. What do we mean by dual? Well, I've got four nodes in this tropical curve, sort of where three things are coming together. Those are gonna co correspond to the four triangles in this triangulation. Uh, and then I'm gonna connect up two of those nodes exactly when their triangles share an edge. So for example, this triangle and this triangle are connected along this edge. So this node and this node are collected, connected along an edge. And that edge is actually perpendicular to the edge in the triangulation. Similarly, we'll get a perpendicular edge to that edge, namely this one here. And then similarly to get some rays at the boundaries. So don't worry too much about the details. The important thing is somehow something about triangulations encodes the structure of these tropical objects, which is pretty fun. Um, and I'm gonna take just a few more minutes to keep talking about, to, to let you know in a sort of broad question in tropical geometry, and then I'll talk about some of the work I've done with students in this. Um, so if we start increasing uh, how complex our equations are, so this one was degree two, we could have x squared and y squared and xy. What if they're degree three, so we can have x cubes and y cubes? Well, at some point I can just kind of stop writing down equations and start triangulating polygons and then draw those dual pictures. So it turns out that I could triangulate my polygon like this and get this nice tropical curve out. I could triangulate the same polygon like this and get this tropical curve out. Um, now for me personally, these are you know, nice intricate shapes. Sometimes it's nice to have some concrete part of them to focus on. Uh, so I'm gonna actually focus on an area of these that I'm gonna call the skeleton. And this is basically the um, part of the graph that doesn't just look like a bunch of trees going off in all directions, it's sort of, the part that bounds some, some finite regions here. So here we've got a hexagon as our skeleton. Here we've got a little triangle as our skeleton. And in analog with the algebraic geometry, remember we had these curves of genus three because there were three holes in them. I'm gonna say these have genus one because they sort of got one hole in them, this bounded region here. And so a natural question to ask is what can these skeletons look like? These ones basically look like a circle. I mean, you know, a polygonal circle, but kind of like a circle. If we start bumping up what our polygons can look like, maybe not just triangles, maybe this rectangle, maybe we can get some skeleton that have genus two. So we've got um, two bounded regions here and here. Uh, those two regions are actually coming from these interior points. So the fact that we've got some interior points of the polygon means that when you draw your uh, dual picture and wrap around, uh, you're getting actually these regions here. And I would say these two actually look different from each other uh, because they both have two bounded regions these two bounded regions share an edge, sort of as depicted over here. These two bounded regions don't. They're actually sort of joined by a bridge. Uh, and so we might ask, what sorts of shapes can we get out of these tropical curves? And I'll maybe jump ahead to say, what if you were trying to get ones of genus three, that is have three bounded regions? Well, here's sort of all the ways three regions could be affiliated with each other. We can get some tropical curves that look like those but only the first four and not the last one. Uh, so for example, this is one possible arrangement where all the regions border each other, 
Here's a tropical curve that looks like that. Uh, similarly, for the next couple, there's actually no way to cook up a tropical curve. We've got three regions that are sort of assorted like this. And so a big open question, and one of the ones I've worked on with some undergrads is, um, what, first off, what are these candidate graphs up here, and which ones actually show up in the tropical world? Um, so this should give you at least an idea of what the sorts of questions we might ask in tropical geometry are. We have these sort of piecewise linear analogs of algebraic things, and we want to know what can they look like, what sorts of properties do they have. Uh, and so now I'll, I'll, I'll spend a couple minutes just talking about some of the mentorship I've done of undergrads through research uh, in this. A lot of that has been through um, Williams College's small REU. Uh, it's actually a very big REU. The small actually refers to the five professors who did it the first iteration. Uh, actually, a few of them are in this photo, which was from 2018. So uh, Professor Silva down here is the S. Professor Adams back here is the A. I really wish there had been one more professor that had an A initial, because then it could have been llamas. But oh well, missed opportunity. I'm, I'm back there. But most of the folks in this photo are undergrads who um, spent the summer on uh, Williams campus engaging in math research, um, tackling open problems, learning all sorts of important skills uh, for you know, presenting mathematics, improving mathematics, write, writing up mathematics, um, and also hopefully figuring out whether or not mathematics was the sort of career they'd want to go on into. Um, and so uh, I ran slash will run tropical geometry groups most of the summers since I've been at Williams. So 2017, 2018, I'll also be running one remotely in 2020. We were going to have it on campus and can't for obvious reasons, um, but uh, we'll still be doing all that remotely. Uh, so let me just show off a couple of the, the folks I've advised. So here's uh, the 2017 group. So we've got Andrew, Sifon, Desmond, and uh, Nilov, plus me. Uh, this is actually at OSU's campus, The Ohio State University. Uh, there was a young mathematicians conference there that they all got to present at at the end of the summer. Um, and they did some very cool work. They actually proved the strongest known results to that question I posed, namely, what sorts of graphs can we get? What can these skeletons look like? Um, they actually have the strongest known results there. They also studied something about the interplay between tropical curves and algebraic curves, especially in terms of degrees of freedom uh, in, in constructing those. I also did a group in 2018. So there's Teresa, Julie, Franny, myself, Ivan, and Sammy. Uh, these folks actually proved a ton of theorems uh, on a topic I'm not talking about today, chip firing games on graphs. You can see my one hour mentor talk if you didn't see that already for, for that material, it's very much related to uh, tropical geometry. Again, some kind of discrete version of algebraic geometry. So they prove tons of awesome stuff. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why I like tropical geometry as a research topic for undergrads. And now that you've seen what tropical geometry is, hopefully you'll agree with me on some of these things. Um, so one thing I really like about it as, as a research topic for undergrads is it's accessible. It's very hands-on and combinatorial. You can sort of hand people it on the first day. They can pick a polygon, start triangulating it. Um, it's still going to be relevant to deep mathematics. Uh, and this is something I haven't really touched on. It turns out that there is a connection between our algebraic geometry world and our tropical geometry world. There's a way to take these algebraic objects and turn them tropical through a process appropriately named tropicalization. So that means that if you have some students who are proving a very combinatorial thing that's maybe accessible for them, you can still take that and apply it to prove some very powerful theorems. So it's not just that it's like a hands-on toy example. It's a hands-on example that will have very important implications. And especially the work my 2017 students did really connected these two worlds, even though a lot of what they did was um, you know, sort of very accessible, combinatorial, triangulation sorts of things. Another nice thing about tropical geometry is, at least in the grand scheme of math, it's relatively new. I mean, really got started in the 1980s. Uh, so I think it's, it's about as old as I am, which for a mathematical field is, uh, is pretty young. So this has a number of obvious pluses. One is they do exist low-hanging fruit sorts of problems where I can look at a problem and say, oh, that'll be accessible for an undergrad and it hasn't been done yet. Let's give it to them to give them some practice. So certainly that's nice. But maybe more importantly, it leaves a lot of room for creativity. Uh, so um, because a lot of the foundational results are still sort of being figured out and a lot of the framework with which we're looking at it is still being determined, there's a lot of room for students to sort of make their own path and how they think about problems and not just solve problems, 
but also sort of pose problems and figure out what the good questions to ask are. And especially my 2018 group did a ton of this with their chip firing work. Um, so that's a really, another really nice plus of it. Um, as I've mentioned, it strongly parallels algebraic geometry. Uh, you know, we saw these intersections of lines behaving the same. There were some factorization results that seemed the same. Uh, so there's a couple natural um, advantages. One is that it gives students natural guesses about what sorts of theorems might be true, things that they can conjecture and maybe prove or possibly disprove. So just as an example, uh, we have Bezu's theorem in the classical world telling us how many uh, intersection points to expect. We could study Bezu's theorem in the tropical world. So here's a degree two and a degree three intersecting. Well, there's definitely gonna be some fine print because that's infinitely many intersection points, but maybe there's some way I can convince myself this should be counted as six intersection points. Um, and so because there's this rich world of algebraic geometry out there, um, there's n a natural set of problems for students to try and figure out. Um, it also helps them learn another area of mathematics. So if they spend a summer doing tropical geometry and then go on to grad school and take an algebraic geometry class, a lot of the ideas and topics are gonna be more familiar to them. They'll have intuition for how these things work. Uh, and there's actually lots of connections to other fields well beyond algebraic geometry. I'll list a couple there. We've already seen some discrete optimization. There's knot theory, which is another area of math, some numerical computation results. There's cool applications to computational biology, like constructing phylogenetic trees and stuff. There's some cryptography applications that are really fun. There's even applications to auction theory, so figuring out um, how people should be allowed to bid on things in some way that's fair. So what that means is if a student has a really strong passion for one of these many, many fields, we can figure out a way to pivot that research in the direction of tropical geometry. So uh, I don't know what the main takeaway necessarily from these two slides is. Maybe it's, ah, I should get some students interested in tropical geometry, or maybe it's just, ah, these are some nice things to keep an eye out for when picking research problems for students to work on. Um, you know, maybe you can't find all of them with one topic, but if you find three or four of these big advantages, they could be really, really nice things to have. Um, the last slide I did wanna just really quickly mention, um, I contributed to another resource for mentoring undergraduates in mathematical research. Um, and this could be aimed at either undergrads who don't have access to a traditional mentoring environment of an REU, uh, or it could be for someone mentoring undergrads for the first time, and they just don't have a good idea of what uh, problems to give them. Uh, so this book is a project-based guide to undergraduate research in mathematics. I think it's maybe getting shipped in June. So if you want to pre-order a copy, you can. Uh, and I contributed a chapter to it. Here's a screenshot of one of my pages. And basically it's a quick introduction to tropical geometry, similar to what I've been sharing with you, but interspersed throughout are all these different research projects that are appropriate for undergrads to approach. So for instance, there's one, there's one as well. You can see some of the material that I've talked about today here. Uh, and um, if you don't feel like buying a book, that's fine. Some of the chapters are posted on archive.org where mathematicians like to um, post their preprints. In particular, if you search Ralph Morrison tropical geometry on archive, uh, you can find my chapter and you know share it with any folks who you think might find it interesting. Uh, so that's, that's all I had for today.